Good morning to all at the Foreign Correspondence Club of Thailand in Bangkok and good evening to those watching elsewhere over our live stream on Facebook. I'm Gwen Robinson, the former uh, president of the Foreign Correspondence Club of Thailand and editor at large of Nikkei Asia. As, uh, as you all know, today we're here to hear about a new criminal complaint filed against Myanmar's generals for atrocity crimes uh, led by Fortify Rights and some of the complainants in the new case. Um, uh, so very quickly, and uh, as you all know, and I think we've all seen some horrific images in recent years of military brutality in Myanmar, including mutilated bodies, burning villages, civilians being beaten, um, and uh, from earlier years when the military expelled more than 750,000 Rohingya Muslims, um, we've seen uh, those sort of images uh, years back. As the second anniversary of Myanmar's military coup approaches, the country's military leaders have yet to be held accountable for the crimes um, committed throughout the country, uh, not just over those earlier years, but since uh, February 1st, uh, 2021. Um, and uh, as you also know, there are various cases um, trying to do something about that. This, what you'll hear about today is the first case that's also addressing the atrocities committed since uh, the coup, the military uh, seizure of power, and uh, that makes it extremely significant. So I'll just um, briefly introduce the panelists. We're going to watch an extremely short film, and we will then hear from the panelists, uh, including a couple overseas via Zoom, and then you will be able to ask questions uh, and um, uh, have some discussion. So first, just to briefly introduce uh, to my immediate right is Matthew Smith, co-founder and chief executive officer of Fortify Rights. Matthew previously worked with Human Rights Watch, Earth Rights International, and Kerry, Kerry Kennedy of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Uh, next to him is Pavani Nagaraja Bhatt, uh, an investigations associate at Fortify Rights, who has been with Fortify since 2022. Previously, she worked with Legal Action Worldwide, um, Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and Project 39A. Uh, next to her is John Quinley III, Director at Fortify Rights, who's been with the organisation since 2016. He previously worked with Partners Relief and Development Myanmar. Uh, and then joining us by Zoom is Nikki Diamond, a Burman Muslim complainant and member of the Board of Directors at Fortify Rights. Uh, and he will then uh, be joined by Abdul Rashid, a Rohingya complainant who fled Myanmar to the US after the 2021 military coup. He was a Rohingya parliamentary candidate contesting Myanmar's elections in both 2015 and 2022. Both his candidacies were rejected by Myanmar's election commissioners on the ground of his uh, ethnicity. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, to get straight into this, uh, Matt, as uh, head of... Uh, Fortify Rights, uh, can you introduce the whole thing, uh, explain the complaint background and why you chose Germany to file it? Absolutely, thank you so much, Gwen. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Yeah, I'll give a bit of the background. So back in uh, 2019, my colleagues and I were exploring uh, options for victims of the Rohingya genocide specifically to access justice. Uh, we, were, we were at the time uh, mindful of some of the geopolitical hurdles in place, uh, specifically the, the inability to get the UN Security Council to refer the situation, uh, inability to get the UN Security Council to, to um, uh, refer the situation in Myanmar to the International Criminal Court. Uh, an ICC referral uh, still needs to happen and we're still advocating for a referral, but we did at that point in time begin to explore the possibility of other options for survivors and victims of crimes to access justice. We began considering uh, universal jurisdiction cases. Uh, for those who may not be familiar, as you, as you saw in this film, uh, this short film, universal jurisdiction is a legal concept that basically enables a state to prosecute individuals who are responsible for mass atrocity crimes, regardless of where the crimes occurred, 
or the nationality of the perpetrator or the victims. Um, mass atrocity crimes are also known as international crimes, and so you, you may hear these terms used interchangeably. Um, there are three main categories of atrocity crimes, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, each of which are defined under international law. Uh, the Myanmar military, uh, as you all know, has been committing mass atrocity crimes for decades with complete impunity. So in 2019, in the wake of genocidal attacks against Rohingya and in the absence of justice, we began exploring international legal options for survivors in Myanmar to pursue criminal prosecutions under universal jurisdiction. Uh, we researched and analyzed the feasibility of 16 different jurisdictions in Europe, Africa, and South America each of which in their own way provides uh, access to justice for atrocity crimes committed outside their national borders. Uh, ultimately, we decided to file in Germany. Uh, this was pre-COVID, uh, this was pre-coup in Myanmar. We were initially preparing a complaint related specifically to the Rohingya genocide. Everything changed on February 1st, 2021. When the military's coup and subsequent nationwide attack on the civilian population began, our team at Fortify Rights uh, became overwhelmed with work to ensure the protection of human rights defenders who were fleeing or otherwise avoiding the military junta. Uh, and then we expanded our investigative work and then expanded our plan uh, for the complaint. It, it likewise grew into uh, a complaint including post-coup mass atrocity crimes. So we located several individuals who survived uh, or witnessed mass atrocity crimes. Um, post-coup and wanted to pursue this type of justice. So today we are announcing that Fortify Rights and 16 individual survivors and witnesses of atrocity crimes in Myanmar have filed a criminal complaint with the Federal Prosecutor General of Germany under the German Code of Crimes Against International Law. The complaint uh, is, is quite large. The complaint is 215 pages long. Uh, it includes more than 1,000 pages of annexes, uh, which we did not print. Um, the complaint provides uh, extensive evidence to assist the federal prosecutor to investigate and prosecute those responsible for the most serious crimes under, interna under international and German law. Uh, Fortify Rights is represented by one of the world's preeminent law firms, Covington and Burling, uh, which has offices in Germany. Approximately half of the 16 complainants in the complaint survived the Rohingya genocide and military-led clearance operations in 2016 and 2017, and approximately half survived post-coup atrocities in states and regions throughout Myanmar in 2021 and 2022. Uh, the complaint provides new evidence proving that the Myanmar military systematically killed, raped, tortured, imprisoned, disappeared, persecuted, and committed other acts that amount to genocide crimes against humanity, and war crimes in violation of German law. The complaint includes evidence showing that senior hun military junta officials exercised superior responsibility over subordinates who committed crimes, and that those officials knew about their subordinates' crimes and failed to take any action to prevent the crimes or to punish the per perpetrators. The complaint is on file with the German authorities, and uh, for several reasons it's not publicly available, but of course we are here uh, to speak with you about it today. Uh, our primary objective is for the German federal prosecutor to open an investigation, collect and preserve evidence for prosecutions, and issue arrest warrants against those responsible for these heinous crimes. As I'm sure you know, there are, uh, and as, as Gwen mentioned, there are numerous international accountability initiatives that are ongoing with respect to crimes in Myanmar. Uh, however, not a single perpetrator in the country has been account held accountable for international crimes. The 16 complainants in this case, Fortify Rights and our partners do aim to change that. With regard to the other ongoing uh, accountability initiatives, they include an investigation by the International Criminal Court into forced deportation of Rohingya. There's a trial at the International Court of Justice on state responsibility for the Rohingya genocide. And there's an important universal jurisdiction case in Argentina with regard to the Rohingya genocide. And we're happy to discuss today how this complaint uh, differs from these all very important initiatives. Uh, there's some language in the news release that we published today to that effect as well. Uh, we do believe that Germany is in a unique position to thwart impunity in Myanmar and fill existing gaps with regard to justice and accountability for survivors in Myanmar. 
The complaint also lists numerous resource people and organizations who agreed to make themselves available to assist German law enforcement. Uh, there's actually a section in the complaint devoted to these resource people and organizations. They include UN Special Rapporteur Tom Andrews, two former UN Special Rapporteurs, members of the UN fact-finding mission, as well as prominent human rights defenders from Myanmar. For security reasons, the identities of, of several uh, resource people remain confidential. Several human rights organizations led and directed by Myanmar people have agreed to come forward to assist the German authorities. These organizations are included in the complaint, uh, and they include the Chin Human Rights Organization, the Karen Human Rights Group, the Kareni Human Rights Group, the Human Rights Foundation of Monlan, the Burmese Rohingya Organization UK, and an, organi an organized network of Myanmar lawyers working throughout the country and others. This initiative today represents more than two years of work by our team at Fortify Rights, by the legal team and by the individual complainants. Uh, and it's no exaggeration to say that every single member of our team at Fortify Rights did contribute to this effort in one way or another. Uh, many of them are here today. And our legal representatives at Covington and Burling provided lawyers in, in multiple countries, actually in the US and in Europe, to work hand in hand with Fortify Rights and the complainants for justice and accountability. Most important, I would like to acknowledge the 16 survivors, the 16 complainants. This is their complaint, and it's no small action to be filing this complaint. Our team stands with them in their struggle for justice and accountability. Members of the military junta should not feel safe from justice in this world and they must be held accountable. Anyone who is a part of the military junta and has information and would like to do the right thing should come forward and cooperate with international justice mechanisms. The military junta is not the government of Myanmar. It's a criminal enterprise and will be treated as such. Senior General Min Aung Lang is leading Myanmar on a dark path to nowhere. He and, he and others responsible for these atrocity crimes must be held accountable. Uh, Lastly, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I'm really grateful to be back at the FCCT, really grateful to see all of you here today, uh, really grateful to those who are tuning in via the live stream. Uh, thank you all for, for taking time. Uh, yeah, thank I'll, cl you. I'll close there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. As I mentioned, there will be questions afterwards, and for those watching on Facebook, you're welcome to type questions in. They will be asked for you from the floor. Um, so after we hear from the others, and I'd like to turn to Pavani Nagaraja Bhatt, um, an investigations associate at Fortify Rights, who's actually going to focus more on the coup-related aspects of the complaint, in other words, the atrocities um, that have been recorded since uh, the power seizure. Over to you, Pavani. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you, Matt. The 16 individuals from Myanmar who are complainants in this criminal complaint are survivors and witnesses of mass atrocities. The complainants belong to seven ethnic groups of Myanmar. They are Rohingya, Arakanese, Chin, Karen, Kareni, Burman, and Mon. Six of them are women and the rest are men. While seven of the complainants are survivors and witnesses of post-coup crimes against humanity, the remaining nine are Rohingya, and they are survivors of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Complainants were all in Myanmar when they survived atrocities, and ha some have then, have then fled the country. They are now living in Myanmar, Bangladesh, Malaysia, India, Germany, and the US. They are scholars, homemakers, farmers, business persons, students, and most importantly, they are all human rights defenders. Today, I'll speak about crimes that we were able to investigate and document that occurred following the February 2021 coup. In March 2022, Fortify Rights published a report along with Yale Law School's Shell Center for Human Rights, which documented widespread and systematic human rights violations in Myanmar following the coup. The report is titled Nowhere is Safe, and it is on display. This complaint takes evidence from that report and goes a step further. We ask that for the first time in history, the Myanmar military be held accountable for all of its crimes against all ethnic groups. In developing this complaint, we spoke to individuals from many ethnic groups about their lives before the coup, on the day of the coup, and the months and the years following it. 
the testimony we've gathered from complainants and the information we receive from partner human rights organizations demonstrate a pattern of abuse and impunity on the part of the Myanmar military. This abuse and impunity has been rampant for decades. While the Myanmar military is genocidal, decades-long persecution of the Rohingya minority has been documented. The aftermath of the coup demonstrates that the military's brutality knows no distinction. Despite coming from different regions, ethnic groups, and backgrounds, all the complainants have suffered deeply since the coup. They've lost homes, family members, livelihoods, their freedoms, and many still live in a constant state of fear despite living outside their countries. What they've witnessed and survived is horrific. Almost all of them spoke about extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, sexual violence, torture, shelling, destruction of civilian property, suppression of the freedom of speech and expression, and many other rights included under the right to life and liberty. And because of these severe restrictions imposed by the junta on some of the most fundamental rights and liberties, we found that in a majority of the cases, the victims of mass atrocities are terrified of speaking out. They fear retaliation from the junta. And that's the reason half the complainants have remained anonymous even before the German prosecutor. The other half decided to reveal their identities to the German authorities. And that's not because of the absence of fear or security threats against them or their families. It's only because they felt an obligation to speak out publicly for the sake of the revolution and to fight against the junta. During our regular check-ins with complainants over the last two years, we repeatedly gauged their comfort levels in revealing their identity to German authorities. Despite ongoing violations, the 16 individuals who are part of this complaint feel compelled to act to end impunity. The Karani complainant told us that him and his organization have accepted the risks. He said, and I quote, we cannot stand by and watch anymore. A handful of other complainants also know that they're on the watch list of the junta. They've been arrested, detained, tortured, and yet they're part of this complainant. The Arakanese complaint is a human rights activist. He was arrested, tortured, and shot at, uh, and he was arrested, detained, and tortured by the military. He now, he's now a refugee in a neighboring country and is still being targeted by the authorities in the host country. Yet he continues to speak against the dictatorship. The Chin complainant lives in a neighboring country. She was a farmer for years before she became a homemaker. She is now a single mother of three young children. Her husband, a pastor, was arbitrarily arrested by the junta, along with four other people. The four others were released, and her husband, the pastor, was never released. The complainant doesn't know what happened to him. The military merely told another group of pastors that he was killed. She doesn't believe he's dead. She and her children still await his return. What is truly remarkable about this group of complainants and many other Myanmar nationals we work with is their desire for justice and accountability. With each of these complainants, we had multiple conversations to go through their experiences, trying to get exact details of how their rights were violated. Throughout these conversations, they have stayed steadfast in their commitment to speak truth to power and hold perpetrators accountable. By participating in this complaint, the complainants are saying enough is enough. I am proud to have worked with this brave community of survivors and to stand with them in their fight against impunity. I am also proud to have worked with Fortify Rights team members, especially those from Myanmar, who are committed to the cause but can't be here today for several reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavani. Uh, Pavani mentioned uh, some of the reports that are uh, available. One, I think, is available today, Nowhere is Safe, but the others, I think, uh, there's only display copies, but if you're interested, they're on display at the registration desk and you can ask um, for copies to be sent to you or find them online. So with that, I'd like to turn to John Quinley the third, um, who is going to focus on uh, the Rohingya-related aspects of the complaint. So over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Gwen, and thank you, everyone, for coming out today. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this universal jurisdiction filing. Uh, I have immense respect for the courage uh, and continuous fight for justice my Rohingya colleagues and friends have shown. Um, there's been overwhelming uh, support um, from Rohingya refugees in southern Bangladesh and beyond to participate in the justice process and to be involved in this criminal complaint. 
um, my colleagues and I at Fortify Right started approaching Rohingya refugees and others uh, to join the universal jurisdiction complaint, uh, and they gave us uh, mass amounts of their time. I particularly want to thank uh, my Fortify Rights colleague, Zal Wynn, uh, who can't be up here today for a number of reasons, but he worked day in and day out uh, with Rohingya complainants, uh, answered questions, and ensured Rohingya people in Bangladesh were informed about the legal process the entire way. Um, there are 10 Rohingya complainants who have joined the filing. They come from Butidong, Mongda, Ratidong, and Sitwe townships. Um, there's also one uh, ethnic Rakhine, Arkanese, uh, person who has joined, and this is significant. Uh, it shows that five years after the August 2017 attacks, there's waves of unity uh, amongst Rakhine, Arkanese, and Rohingya people. Uh, and the filing includes testimony from him, and Pavani shared a little bit about his story. All the Rohingya in this complaint uh, spoke about crimes that constitute genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. While most of our uh, investigative work in the past has focused on the crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity related to the Rohingya, this complaint also focuses on war crimes that took place in Rakhine State in 2016 and 2017. With respect to nearly all the incidents of atrocities that occur occurred during the non-international armed conflict in 2017, the victims qualify as protected persons under international humanitarian law as they were civilians with no participation in the hostilities and no concrete relation to the Rohingya militant group at the time. The Rohingya complainants have ex all experienced or witnessed atrocity crimes, and the testimonies that we've gathered showcase unimaginable violence. More than 300 villages were burned in 2017 during the attacks, and it displaced more than 700,000 people to Bangladesh, where many remain today. For example, a 51-year-old Rohingya complainant, who for security reasons we're referring to as FK, uh, told us about how in August 2017, soldiers and non-Rohingya residents entered her village in northern Rakhine State burned homes and prevented residents from leaving or fleeing the village. Individuals uh, during that time under the military's control raped FK's daughter-in-law while FK was in earshot uh, as soldier beat her in an, in, in an adjacent room. The Myanmar military killed seven members of FK's family in the attack on her village and in a separate incident cut her with a knife leaving permanent scars. Another Rohingya complainant, now living in the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, also spoke about how almost his entire family were killed. He said, and I quote, eight of my family members were killed, including my mother, two of my sisters, my wife, two nephews, and my two children. Outside direct physical violence that took place during the genocide, other, another aspect in the complaint talks about the ongoing restrictions uh, and decades of restrictions that Rohingya have faced in Rakhine State. Uh, a Rohingya complainant who joined the case um, talked about those dec decades of persecution, and he said, and I quote, the travel restrictions have been imposed for a long time by the authorities. We were not allowed to travel freely. We could not go anywhere without permission, and we could not stay overnight in another town. Some Rohingya in the complaint also cite restrictions on the right to nationality and citizenship and the eraser of Rohingya identity. Uh, and this is most recently happening through the National Verification Card process, also known as the NVC. The NVC process effectively stripped Rohingya of access to full citizenship rights and anything that is, is associated with that and essentially does not allow Rohingya to self-identify. Finally, it's important to note that the genocide and the atrocities are still ongoing today and impunity is uh, rampant throughout the country. And it's for this reason that Rohingya, like FK, and other ethnicities in Myanmar are bringing this universal jurisdiction complaint forward. Uh, in closing, I wanna read a statement that FK uh, gave us about why she joined the complaint. Uh, and I'm gonna quote her now. As a Rohingya woman, I want justice for the genocide so that it does not happen again. As a Rohingya complainant, I am ready to file the UJ, Universal Jurisdiction, case. 
thank you all very much and happy to answer questions about uh, the Rohingya side. I will hand it over uh, now to Gwen and I think Nikki. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, so we'll uh, continue on. We're going to zoom over to Europe uh, and uh, turn to you, Nikki Diamond, uh, uh, who is a, a Burman Muslim complainant and member of the board of directors at Fortify Rights, who's done a considerable amount of research and investigation into these kind of complaints. So uh, yeah. over to you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, Gwen, and thank you for everyone who coming. And I'm so happy to, and I'm very honored to join this panel. Yeah, the the legal principle of universal jurisdiction is to prevent impunity and hold perpetrators of international crime and their criminal liability. The principle is unique in the way that provide for state jurisdiction over international crime such as genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity even when the elite crime did not occur in that state territory, and neither the victim, survival, nor elite perpetrated a national or that state. We are seeking justice against the crime of genocide, crime against humanity, and war crime committed by the military in Myanmar. We rely on the German judiciary to open investigation. This is the time to end perpetrated impunity, to ensure that they no longer get away with their crimes. This is not only a responsibility, but also an obligation in international law, from which no derogation is legitimized or permitted. Since the Myanmar military attempted a coup on February 1st, 2021, we no longer believe in our national justice system. By opening a court case now, we are combating our national justice system administrated by the military, Myanmar military hunter. But we are encouraging all victims of survival to come forward until justice will be served. If we do not act, serious crime go and punish, the perpetrator even repeat their crime with absolute impunity. This is exactly what is now happening in Myanmar. During the military genocide campaign against Rohingya in 2016 and 2017, military soldiers killed Rohingyas, including children, girls, and women. They threw Rohingya into fire, raped Rohingya women and girls, and after raping, they even killed them, burned down Rohingya villages, and looted Rohingya property. After the coup, the same pattern of serious crime against civilians in various parts of Myanmar continue. This systematic pattern of atrocity crime is even not new to our ethnic brother and sister because they have suffered for several decades in their homeland. Until today, perpetrators or perpetrator still enjoy impunity. On 17 July 2021, the, unit, the, the National Unity Government NUG, the legitimate government of the people of Myanmar, submitted a declaration under Article 12.3 of the Rome Statute, accepting the International Criminal Court jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute across city crime committed in Myanmar. Until today, we have not had any news from the ICC prosecutor office. We therefore put our hopes in the German prosecutor to act more efficiently and to conduct an investigation into the crimes of genocide, crimes in humanity, and war crimes in Myanmar. I end my statement, uh, statement with a quote from Vavil Havel. He gave his interview to a French journalist in March 1983 after he was relieved from prison and I'm inspired by his interview. And I quote, I merely take the side of truth again lie, the side of sense again nonsense, the side of justice again injustice. For the international community, this is the time to take side with us against the Myanmar military. We victims and survival of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crime deserve access to justice through universal jurisdiction. Germany is our best choice and we trust in them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki. That was Nikki Diamond, a complainant in the case just filed in Germany. And uh, finally, I'd like to turn to another complainant in the case, Abdul Rashid, um, a Rohingya uh, Muslim who fled Myanmar to the US after the 2021 military coup. So Rashid, over to you. Uh, good evening, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. 
uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I am thankful to Matthew Spirit and all 45 rights for their entire efforts to make this possible. My name is Abdul Rashid. I am a Rohingya. I am born, I was born in 1962, the year the first military coup happened in Myanmar, when General Nguyen came up with the military coup and they destroyed the democratic government and the democratic system. I was born in Nazi village in the Kaim state, which was born down in 2012. All of my relatives and neighbor and my childhood friends are pushed to the IDP camps. They living there with the hope that one day they will go back to their home, but never happened. There's still hundreds of, over 100,000 people living in the IDP camp. I am the witness of the atrocities and the crimes committed by the Myanmar military. I have been witnessing the crimes because we are grown up in a society that dominated by the military. They are not respect people. Regardless, I was the parliamentary, I was the election candidate, parliamentary candidate in 2015 and 2020. But very unfortunately, they have disqualified me without any reason. I am a registered voter. My parents are the voter. My father was the government officer. He joined the Myanmar Marine. He was the captain of the ship. He joined the Myanmar Marine in 1954, and he served 38 years. And they denied my parents' citizenship. According to Myanmar law, not a non-citizen cannot get any pension. But my father was receiving pension. So, but there was no justification to deny me as an election candidate. I have been visited several countries along with the international media, Matthew Smith and the 45 Rights to conduct witnessing and interviews with the genocidal survivor and the who people survive from the human traffickers. I have been visited Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh several times. I am the witness interviewed by the victims. I was interviewed one woman, the girl, she was 21 in a Bangladesh, Kapsas Bazar. She was raped by the Myanmar authorities. When first time I met her, in a clinic, she was bleeding because of the rape. She said, we are 20 girls taken by the military in a school. Why are the 50 to 60 military personnel are there? And then they rape our night, one by one. And six innocent young girl, the age of the 12, 9, 13, was dead. She said, I, would, I become unconscious. How the military destroy the country, communities, targeted Muslim, especially Rohingya. They started campaign against the Rohingya since the first military coup, they try to bar Rohingya to become a political force. They don't want Rohingya in the parliament. That's why they use multiple tactics to bar Rohingya from the parliament, 
and from the politics. And then they started campaign against the Rohingya to push them out of the country, denying of their citizenship. Rohingya are the citizen of the country. We are living in a generations. Majority, 90 plus percent of the Rohingya, they have citizen of the country. They got the citizenship card, but literally they denied citizenship by using different type of cards. TRC, NVC, some other cards. They rejected our voting rights. Now today, 70% of Rohingya are now living out of the country. Over 1 million Rohingya living in the Bangladesh and half of the million Rohingya living in several countries. They have impose a heavy restriction on Rohingya. The Rohingya cannot move one place to another place. Rohingya doesn't have a access to the justice. Rohingya doesn't have a land right. They are Rohingya people. Cannot move one place to another place. They cannot go to the bank. They cannot go to the any economic association. So now they are migrating. They try once the Rohingya travel within the country, they have been arrested. Now more than thousands Rohingya girls and children, young, are in the prison because they are traveling in the country, within the country. So this is the Myanmar military. They committed all the crimes, atrocity crimes, crimes of humanity against humanity, crimes of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Thank you. They destroyed the communities. It has to stop now. Rashid, thank Military you very much. Uh, sorry, go on. Do, would you like to finish off now? What say? Would you like to uh, conclude? Okay, yes. Thank you. So now we are seeking justice and the accountability. Many of the Rohingya, I as I complain because of the I am a victim myself. So why we choose the German to complain? Because we believe German government will go process without any influence because there are the, some countries influencing to other countries. So that's why we joy, we ap ap applied to the German with the hope that German will go through the process without any interference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Rashid, for that. And thank you to all the panelists. I'd like to turn to questions and answers. I think we have some on Facebook with quite a few people watching the live stream and from the floor. If you'd like to ask a question, the microphone is over there. Please identify yourself. If you don't want to identify yourself fully, just give an idea of why you're here. Uh, and also, perhaps as with the moderator's prerogative, I'd just like to ask a quick question, which is um, uh, perhaps to Matt, when would you expect to hear from the German federal prosecutor? I mean, what is the, I don't know if there's a standard in the case, but you mentioned in the press statement that Germany is currently investigating or involved in many, many cases of, um, of uh, various crimes against humanity, et cetera. So perhaps you could tell us. Yeah, th thank you, Gwen. Uh, the, our understanding is there are more than 100 uh, ongoing investigations under universal jurisdiction in Germany. Uh, we, of course, hope that the German authorities will uh, pick up this uh, complaint and commence with an investigation collect and preserve evidence, issue arrest warrants. Uh, however, we, we can't say with any certainty uh, what the timeline will be, uh, but uh, we, we are hopeful uh, that the authorities will recognize the urgency of the situation and, um, and will take action accordingly. Right, yeah. it does seem Germany has actually joined uh, another case, uh, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, you mean um, another case?
case. International um, supporting the IC, ICJ, was it? There, there, yeah. there are, uh, yeah, there, there are a number of, um, of ongoing uh, investigations. Uh, the German authorities opened up um, structural investigations into war crimes in Ukraine, for example, into atrocities in Syria. Uh, there have been a number of successful universal jurisdiction cases uh, in Germany and elsewhere, and, and if anybody's interested, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to take a closer look at that as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I'd like to invite any questions uh, from the floor, please. Uh, my, name, my name is Da Yu from the VUE Burmese. I have a question to the Medu Smith. So, uh, the double I double M, the UN mechanism has their own documents, and they they have a case file against the Burmese regime. Uh, there are also the case file at the ICC you mentioned and the ICG with the Gambia. So, do you have any coordination with those international mechanisms? We do actually. Thank you for the question. Uh, we we have been coordinating. Uh, we have been providing evidence to the I M for some time since its founding, and um, and we have uh, briefed the I M on the plans for this complaint. And in fact, the I M is it was created specifically for this type of situation where justice uh, uh, justice procedures, if justice procedures are to open up. In, in any venue, really, uh, in theory, the IIMM can provide uh, evidence and case files that it's been collecting to the authorities. So in theory, uh, that can happen with regard to the German authorities. Um, with regard to the International Court of Justice, uh, Fortify Rights has been um, uh, sharing evidence and information with the Gambia's legal team since that case began. Uh, it's quite a long process, and, and we have been involved in that. We have communicated with uh, the offices, uh, the Office of the Prosecutor, individuals at the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court as well. As we mentioned, and as you'll see in the news release uh, that we published today, um, the, the only ongoing investigation at the ICC, which is very important, uh, uh, is with regard to the crime of forced deportation of Rohingya from Myanmar to Bangladesh. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is because the crime uh, of forced deportation um, uh, is believed to have been completed on Bangladesh ter territory, and Bangladesh is a state party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which helped enable jurisdiction in that situation. So Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Raquel Saavedra from the International Commission of Jurists, and I want to thank the panelists for briefing us on this very important update. Um, I have two questions, but perhaps I'll confine it to one at this point so people online can also ask questions. But I wanted to hear perhaps about your strategy in relation to victims and witnesses that are still in the country and ensuring their protection throughout the process. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, Thanks so much. Actually, the uh, president of our board of directors is the secretary general of the ICJ. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's, a, it's an important issue. Uh, at Fortify Rights, security is our, our biggest priority uh, on a daily basis everywhere w that we're working, uh, and, and that's no different with this situation. A number of the complainants in this case are anonymous, uh, which basically means that their information, um, their, their details uh, of their personal information would not be made available without their explicit uh, approval in the event that uh, an investigation uh, or ultimately a trial were to take place. Um, and so there are some complainants that are, uh, have made the, the decision and made their, their own security assessment. Uh, most of them, most of the ones, most of the complainants that are uh, public, for lack of a better word, uh, are, are located in places where they feel secure enough to do that. Uh, but of course there are several who are not. And so for, for those reasons, uh, their identities are kept strictly confidential. Thanks, Matt. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, yes, please, sir. Uh, and you, you're quite welcome to ask your follow-up if you'd like. I think my name is Saul Zadka of Arise News Network. I would like to ask Mr. Rashid, to what extent is he deeply disappointed by the reaction of the Muslim world, especially in Asia and the Middle East, to the plight of the Rohingya minority? Thank you, uh, Rashid. Are you with us there? Uh, maybe we've lost him. Uh, 
Julian, is, is he there? Dropped out? Well, <laughs> that was an excellent question. Hopefully we can get him back. Uh, no, I think... Uh, um, Okay, we'll, we'll try and get him back. And if you would like to ask your follow-up, um, unless um, Nikki, as, as a um, Burman Muslim, I wonder if you also have a response uh, on that, about uh, the disappointment, if you have disappointment, about a, a fairly, actually quite a shockingly lukewarm response uh, amongst the Muslim world and OIC and other big organisations to uh, the Rohingya uh, trustees? Um, I, I, I can only elaborate from my um, uh, Burman Muslim point of view. Uh, Burman Muslim in the country, I feel like we are alienated from the other Muslim world because we, we, we are Burman Muslim, we have uh, differences from the other Muslim world. Sometimes, I mean, uh, whatever happening to Myanmar Muslim, um, like me and others, you know, we 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 don't have access to a, anything uh, OICs or any resources. So that's a kind of my personal experience and disappointment. And also, when the Rohingya genocide happened, or I mean, genocide is uh, ongoing, but I don't see the, a lot of uh, support of um, uh, Rohingya Muslim and also Burmese Burmese Muslim in the country. Maybe I think um, Abdul Rashid can take it from me. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we've got him back yet. Can I? Oh, he's back. Uh, yes. Abdul Rashid, did you hear that uh, question? Are you? Do you feel disappointment at uh, the relatively lukewarm response from the Muslim world? And can I add, we've got for the first time uh, in some time uh, the ASEAN chair this year is Indonesia, which is a predominantly uh, Muslim nation. Um, would you expect more, perhaps? Uh, from Indonesia as the chair as well. But I'm just throwing that in to the end of that uh, question. Actually, it is a big frustrating uh, that how the OIC countries is uh, dealing uh, with the Rohingya issues because 70% of the Rohingya now pushed out of the country. Their property has been completely brown off and uh, some other bulldozers and uh, their property is uh, providing to other communities. So uh, this is a very big issue. More than one million people live in the refugee camp. I think is a, there is a, some uh, political geopolitical issue is uh, influenced by the Chinese and the Russian. So that's why what I believe. But they come up beyond because they need to think uh, as a matter of the humanity. Okay, they need to see what happened. Because uh, ASEAN countries need to move forward to uh, help with the people of Myanmar, not the, uh, to help the Myanmar military who are the, uh, you know, uh, prosecuting uh, people of the country. So and they're ruling against the will of the people of the uh, Myanmar. So I think uh, it's a little, yeah, it's a little frustration. Yeah, we are frustrated. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and back to the ICJ. <laughs> Okay, so apologies if this is a bit too legalistic, but I wanted to ask, you raised it that this at the outset, that the prosecutor has discretion to open the investigation or not. The prosecutor is a political officer at the end of the day. They're part of the executive. And one of the biggest criticism, criticisms against Germany as a home for universal jurisdiction is that the prosecutor takes on too many political considerations in determining whether to open an investigation or not. Another interesting thing about Germany is that they've expressed the intention to intervene in the ICJ case. So it shows that there is some kind of willingness of Germany to kind of go forward and try and enforce some sort of international accountability. So I'm wondering if, if within your strategy you're looking at engaging with political, the political branch in Germany as well. Uh, with the authorities, for example, that are filing intervention at the ICJ and whether you hope to also um, perhaps smooth the way with the prosecutor via that as well. Can I ask by political, do you mean also government or parliament or...? Not necessarily parliament, but because the prosecutor is within the attorney general's office, which is 
answerable to the, um, the government. Exactly. So oftentimes, universal jurisdiction cases don't go forward simply because there is some political reason not to. It seems because Germany decided that, or has stated the intention to intervene in the ICJ, it suggests that perhaps there's not these political barriers. But I'm wondering if in your strategy you're thinking about potential political barriers and how you may potentially um, try and address those. Okay, over to you. Thanks so much, great question. Uh, we are definitely in the process of making more friends in Germany who are working towards justice and accountability, not only with regard to the situation in Myanmar, but elsewhere, and we'll definitely continue to do that. Um, uh, there, uh, perhaps worth mentioning, about a week ago, the German foreign minister uh, uh, gave quite a powerful speech about uh, uh, strengthening international law in times of crisis that touches on the importance of universal jurisdiction and some other avenues for justice. I would just add to it as well that uh, given that the military junta in Myanmar is uh, in effect a terrorist regime and, and a global pariah, uh, we don't anticipate any significant political obstacles within the foreign policy of Germany with regard to opening an investigation in this case. Germany is also, as a member of the EU, uh, EU framework is, is uh, part of the sanctions that have been um, issued uh, against uh, individuals and, and others in Myanmar since the coup and before. Uh, and so I think given all of these reasons, uh, we are hopeful that the German authorities will um, uh, certainly take this, uh, take this complaint seriously. Thanks so much. Thank you, and yes, please. Uh, there's a few over there. I have uh, two questions from the Facebook users. I'm from 45 Thanks, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, so like the first question um, is, why are the UN and NGOs agreeing to the Myanmar Junta's uh, guidelines when delivering humanitarian aid when it doesn't cover uh, IDPs? The second question, um, if Germany's universal juridic uh, jurisdiction determines that crimes against hu humanity occurred, what are the concrete um, remedy ramifications for member of the junta. And um, the last question is the, from yeah, Could you maybe say where they're coming from? Or oh, okay. if, if the, uh, if the uh, Right, right. So the first question from Tinmu, uh, Facebook user. And the second question from Roma. Yeah. Right. And then uh, the last question from Panu is, um, what is the time frame for the persecution? Right, I think we uh, addressed that, but uh, uh, should we start with uh, the first question? Matt, do you want to allocate if you think that someone else uh, is more yeah, qualified? Yeah, I'll take the second one. Sure, yeah. Okay, maybe you could repeat the question too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think the first question uh, from online from Zoom um, is why are some UN and humanitarian organizations working with the junta currently in delivering humanitarian aid? Um, there are a number of um, international humanitarian organizations that are working inside Myanmar that have MOUs um, with uh, the junta authorities uh, to operate throughout the countries in hard to reach areas uh, like the dry zone in Sakhine. And there's been a major backlash um, from civil society organizations uh, that are Myanmar people um, saying that no one should be working with the junta at this time. Uh, I think donors and donor government should get creative and flexible in the humanitarian aid that they're delivering and the funding they're delivering so they can do remote modalities, they can do cross-border aid, um, they can be a lot less strict in their requirements, uh, reporting requirements, particularly financial, um, that they're having uh, put, on, put on local organizations. Um, really, the people that are delivering aid to the hardest hit regions in Myanmar right now are civil society organizations in Karen State, in Kareni State, in Sagain. Um, so donor, the donor community should be working with the NUG and working with civil society organizations to uh, fill those gaps uh, and try their best not to work uh, with the junta. Notwithstanding terrible, uh, terrible risks, I think, for a lot of organizations to uh, covertly try and distribute aid inside Myanmar, which gets worse and worse, as we know. Um, second question, Matt, do you want to take it? 
Would you like to take it or? Okay, uh, the, yeah, in terms of Can you repeat that question? Then? Yeah, I think the question, uh, Zoom, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the question was what are the concrete ramifications uh, for members of the junta with regard to the universal jurisdiction complaint? Okay, uh, I, I think, uh, so uh, our objective here is to, is for the German authorities to initiate an investigation, collect and preserve evidence, which it's worth mentioning uh, that evidence can, evidence that, that, that could potentially be collected by German authorities could be put to use not just for prosecutions in Germany. Uh, the German authorities, uh, um, uh, the German authorities could potentially share information in the same way that the IIIM shares information with prosecutions happening elsewhere. So there's an added level of utility to an investigation of Germany outside Germany's borders. Um, but ultimately, uh, the objective is for the authorities to issue arrest warrants. And I think, you know, uh, in the event that that happens, uh, things such as extradition to Germany become very real. Uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of unknowns at this moment, but um, certainly this will send a message to uh, members of the Myanmar military junta and others that are responsible for crimes in Myanmar that they're not safe. They're not safe to travel in, this, in, in our world. They're, not, they're criminals, they should be held accountable. They're responsible for the most atrocious crimes uh, and and uh, and certainly the people of Myanmar will not stop working for justice and accountability. Mm -hmm. Fortify Rights won't stop working for justice and accountability. So I think the, uh, the process um, is certainly not fast, um, but it is significant and it is important. In terms of the, the process uh, duration, we, I think the third question was from um, our club president, Panu Wongchum. Um, but I think it's further from the question I asked, which is, when do you think the prosecutors would decide? Mm -hmm. I think it means also the duration of such an investigation. You said it's not quick. It, it could be many years, right? Uh, potentially, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the German authorities do have the capacity to act swiftly um, and, and efficiently. Have and you known them to, on any other case, uh, be extremely quick? <laughs> How about extremely quick, but uh, I mean, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll uh, we, we trust they will do what needs to be done for sure. Um, and then in, in the meantime, uh, I think there are important aspects of deterrence, for example, deterring uh, military, the military junta from the next massacre, from, from burning the next village down, from uh, these campaigns of systematic rape and other violations that are taking place. Right, although I don't think the fact that uh, various cases have already been filed seems to have, um, <laughs> seems to have scared them at all, but uh, who knows. Um, so I'd like to turn to uh, the gentleman at the microphone. Yes, Please. my name is uh, Jeffrey Bergman. My wife is Nata Siri Bergman. She's chairperson of the Human Rights Lawyers Associ Association of Thailand. Unfortunately, she could not be here this morning. Uh, my question, and I think uh, Matthew has partially answered it, is, is that given the uh, isolationist uh, practice and policy of the, the uh, Myanmar Tatama, can you paint a picture for us of what accountability would look like to fortify rights? Thank you. Well, accountability uh, can, of course, come in, in many forms, um, and what we're doing today is one aspect of it. Uh, and certainly we would hope that the complainants in this case and uh, other survivors, victims, will have their day in court. So that's one, I think that's one picture of what accountab accountability would look like. Um, uh, but of course, uh, you know, there, there could be, there are, there are alternative forms of justice. Um, and right now we're seeing, you know, unprecedented unity in Myanmar, for example, people coming together, reconciling with a difficult past. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's something of justice in that process, I would argue. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. Maybe, maybe my colleagues want to touch on that too. Yeah. I think the complainants have also just uh, expressed that accountability means punishment for the Myanmar military. Um, and that's important to know what the complainants want as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, can I take it? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, <laughs> sorry, Nikki. Yeah, I, I I've seen the uh, two abs two abs abs uh, abs from me 
One is impunity and one is uh, uh, getting access to justice. So in Myanmar, we no longer trust in our national justice system. We cannot get any justice um, in Myanmar. So Germany is the one of our option and alternative to get justice. So victim and survival or genocide, trustworthy crimes, you know, we deserve to get access. So wh whatever, well, wh whatever. So that's the one, getting, just, getting access to justice is the one point. And also Myanmar military, I mean, since its establishment, they have been committing all different kinds of various crimes of atrocity in Myanmar, but they never punished before. So uh, impunity is a, that's why they are repeating same pattern of human rights violation again and again. So they did it genocide. Now they did it other various forms of violence against our civilian. And then they will repeat it again and again until justice is served, until uh, they are accountable. That, that's, that's my point. Thank you. Right. Thank you. That's a very relevant point. Thanks for that, Nikki. Um, over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, Ross Clark. I'm an international lawyer working on Myanmar. Um, just a question in relation to the Argentinian universal jurisdiction case. Uh, what's the point of departure, if any, for yours? Be good to understand similarities, differences. And is there anything that can be learned from that process so far to factor into your process moving forward? Uh, yeah, thanks so, thanks so much. Uh, that, uh, that case, uh, that there's an investigation underway. Uh, the, uh, our colleague, Mong Tung Kin, is a prominent Rohingya human rights defender, uh, brought, um, uh, issued, uh, issued a petition in, to the Argentinian authorities uh, requesting an investigation. There's an investigation that has been launched. Um, as far as we know, uh, that investigation is focusing exclusively on crimes perpetrated against Rohingya people. Uh, which uh, is, is, of course, a bit different than the complaint that, that we filed in Germany. Uh, and um, uh, I had another point there, and it escaped my mind. Um, <laughs> um, what we call a senior moment, Matt. What's that? Yeah, right. I, I also just want to say that we're uh, in pretty close communication with uh, Broke, uh, Mong Toon Kin. Uh, he's a close ally and friend. And so even leading up to the filing of this universal jurisdiction complaint, um, we met with their organization a number of times to try to see how we could complement their efforts in, in Argentina. Um, but I just wanted to make that clear for everyone as well. Um, and then I, I think Toon Kin is offered to, hit, to be a resource person um, also uh, for the German prosecutors. Um, yeah, over to you, Matt. Okay, I think there's a related question here from uh, an Alexander Acker. Um, how would you plan to coordinate uh, with other uh, u universal jurisdiction cases and projects that are being conducted by NUG, Myanmar Accountability Project, et cetera? So there's a number of those sort of investigations underway aiming at universal jurisdiction cases. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's a, apart from Argentina, I don't believe there's any ongoing investigations that have been launched under un, the principle of universal jurisdiction, but we are in touch with uh, Myanmar Accountability Project, for example. Um, and uh, with regard to the Argentinian example, uh, our understanding is that investigation will most likely uh, focus on a very specific geographic area in Rakhine State, crimes that were perpetrated in that, in that area. I think another noteworthy thing is that technically under Argentinian law, uh, 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 while an investigation is, is launched in the context of the Rohingya genocide, um, there's nothing that provides for the prosecution of the crime, specifically of the crime of genocide in Argentina. So in other words, someone could in theory be prosecuted for crimes like uh, uh, homicide, rape, etc., uh, not specifically the crime of genocide, even though the investigation is it was launched and is happening in the context of genocide, which is uh, a fine point, I think, but, but perhaps noteworthy. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, sir. Please keep the yes, good morning, sir. My question is short. Yes, my, my name is Nayatullah. I'm a Canadian citizen now. I'm a Rohingya. So my question is only to the brother Smith, uh, Matthias Smith. In I am working on refugee in Canada, especially for the detainees people who those are in detention center for a long, long time, 
towards no visitors, no anyone help. So I annually do the five, 10 people from Malaysia. Mostly I do from Malaysia because of the Thailand, they don't have a good permit. Mm -hmm. So on this regard, my question is very different than the other people. In this regard, the what fortify right advocate to government of Thailand to release these detainees who those are in detention for a long time without any sustainable future. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, uh, we, we have over the years been documenting uh, the detention of, of refugees here in Thailand. No one should be detained uh, or, or jailed for their immigration status anywhere. Uh, and in Thailand, uh, the government of Thailand can do a lot more to protect the rights of refugees, not only from Myanmar, but from elsewhere. Um, and uh, it is something that uh, we have been advocating for for many years, and, and we, will keep, we will keep pushing. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and, and, and thanks for being here today. We appreciate it. Well, with that, I think um, uh, that seems to be uh, all the questions for now. I, I would like to say that the Fortify Rights team is available, I think, uh, after this, if you have follow-up questions or requests for interviews, as I said, the reports are at the desk. Also, there is a, a book that uh, Fortify Rights put together using images taken by Rohingya photographers. It's not cheap, but all proceeds, it's 1,260 baht, um, but it's full of uh, extremely striking photos and uh, all proceeds, I believe, will go to Rohingya uh, humanitarian uh, uh, cause? To, to the authors. To the authors of this book. That, that's a number of Rohingya photogra uh, photographers. Um, also, uh, just to let you know that the FCCT next week will have um, a very, I think, significant panel discussion to mark the second anniversary of Myanmar's coup on February 1st uh, in the evening at 7 p.m. Um, more details will be put out very shortly, but I hope if you're interested, please come along. We may uh, live stream, we're not sure yet, but that event will definitely be on and we're just trying to uh, finalize some very good speakers. Um, also, for today, you're all welcome. If, you're, if you want a bite to uh, linger around, there's a, a, a lunch menu very reasonably priced and uh, um, please uh, feel free. And I'd like to thank Fortify Rights and also the complainants, particularly Nikki Diamond and Abdul Rashid, because I know you're in different time zones, Nikki, it's some ungodly hour where you are. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you.